morning, everybody. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Appreciate everybody being here. God's good to us, isn't he? Amen. Well, let's start out this Bible lesson this morning with prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for this day. We thank you for all of your blessings in our life. More importantly, God, who you are and what you've done throughout this whole world, not just in our lives. God, we're thankful that you are Lord over all. God, you reign, you are sovereign, and you are above all, God. And we put all our trust in you without reservation, Lord, and we thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, help us today to learn from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Forgive me for my voice. It's a little rough this morning. I always get tested. I don't have COVID, so don't run from me. So, but uh, we'll be all right. We're going to go pretty fast today. I got a lot of information. Probably always have too much, but um, we're going to go fast. I've got a lot of things to say in a short amount of time. <clears throat> I will say this just to start off. The Lord gave me this lesson three weeks ago, and the Sunday, I'd gotten it during the week, and on Sunday, Pastor gets up here and teaches, and um, he used my text. And so I took it as a confirmation. And he went a different direction. But I'm going to tell you something. You don't think God's got everything fit together the way God wants it to fit together? I, do, I actually, uh, Sister Debbie was there. We were sitting behind her during the, during the lesson. I turned to my wife and said, this is crazy. And I said that because there's 30-something thousand verses in the Bible. Okay, if we both picked the New Testament, I'd say, okay, our odds are a little bit better. I'm way over in the Old Testament in Ezekiel where it's like ocean deep. And out of those 30,000 verses, we picked the same one to teach from. So here we go. Ezekiel chapter 14. <clears throat> and verse 14. Though these three men... Noah, everybody say Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver, they, in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their, right, by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. And look at verse 20. God, this is God speaking both times, Old Testament. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job. We're in it. As I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. These verses have, uh, I'm sure I've read them before. I just never parked on them before. <clears throat> Let's look at these three guys very quickly. What do we know about Noah? He was a boat builder. Now, he was more than that. The Bible said he was a preacher of righteousness. But he was a boat builder. God had him here for one purpose, really, to build a boat. So if you ever feel like you only have one purpose and your purpose doesn't feel like it's important or relevant, because in Noah's day, was a boat really relevant of that size? <laughs> Was it relevant? It definitely was not, and that's why he received so much mockery from his, uh, I guess, friends. Um, so he had that purpose. Look at Daniel. He was a young man. Later grew into being a prophet. Don't know much about him. He wasn't involved really in anything um, prior to being captured by the Babylonians. 
Look at Job. What do we know about Job? What we know about Job is he was a man from the land of Uz. Boy, doesn't that just stand out. Isn't that just going to hit the front page of the news? He's just a man from Uz. But if our scripture is correct, which we just read, and it's straight out of the book, these three men carried major influence with God. Or... God would never have mentioned them in this contrast. I'll say that again. These three men, and Pastor preached also in Jeremiah, the Lord mentioned Moses and Samuel in that verse. But these three men carried major influence of God, or God would have never brought their names to the surface in the midst of an Israel circumstance. So what makes these guys such influential in the eyes of God? Look at Noah, Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. There he, there you have it. There's a story of Noah's life. Just, now when we say perfect, all men have sinned. So the Bible is really typifying that he was a really good guy, but he ain't perfect. But according to people he was around, he, he looked probably perfect. And Noah walked with God. And you know, the Lord brought this to me. He said, you know, Noah walked with me. He didn't take a walk with me. There's a way big difference between those two statements. If you take a walk with God, you walk with God, let's just say on Sunday. And then we say, God, I'll see you Wednesday. That's called taking a walk. But when you walk with God, you walk with God on Sunday. And then you say, God, come with me Monday. I need you on the tractor. God, I need you Tuesday. I'm heading over here. And so there's a vast difference. And I know this is very simple this morning, but there's a vast difference between taking a walk and walking with God. People who take a walk are not going to go very far in God. And I hope they continue walking with God. Noah built an ark, just a daily grind. Daily grind. Sometimes we feel like that in our jobs. Daily grind. Daily grind. Keep sawing the boards, keep nailing the nails, keep pitching the tar. Just a daily grind. And sometimes we feel like we're insignificant because of that. Nobody knows what I do. God always knows. I always remember that. But nobody knows what I do. Nobody knows what I take care of. The little things nobody ever sees. Don't worry about it. God knows. So Noah was obedient. Now let's look at Job. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed, that means shunned, evil, kept it away from him. Oh boy. And it was so, mine small, when the days of their feasting were gone, about that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Here's what we know about Job. Perfect in the sense. Upright. Feared God. Shunned evil. And rose up every morning and offered sacrifices continually to God. Think that'll hit the front page of the papers? You think they'll have him preach at the general conference? Not minimizing that. That's a that's a uh, honorable thing to do. But the point is, Job lived an ordinary life like you and I. Noah lived an ordinary life like you and I. Let's look at one more, Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. 
Then this Daniel was preferred above all the presidents, above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him. Whoo, can't find that too much today, can we? And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find none occasion, nor fault. I wish I was in that spot. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Daniel, extraordinary spirit, faithful man, high moral and character and integrity, no negligence or corruption. Three times a day, he prayed and gave thanks. Let's be honest. Very honest. Kind of boring lives. No mountaintop experiences. No split in the Red Sea. No raising the dead. No preaching and thousands come to repentance. No Elijah or Elisha. Just three men who just, if I can say this, and I don't mean it by saying just, they walked with God. They feared God. They prayed. They had an excellent spirit in them. They were trustworthy. They had integrity. They shunned evil. And God mentions them specifically in his word. God could have picked somebody else. But he picked these three. Why? Because they had major influence with God. And I know God loves everybody, but think of these guys as in the Hall of Fame. God's Hall of Fame. God's Hall of Fame. Kind of makes sense with the New Testament. Let's look at Mark chapter 10, 42 through 44. But Jesus called them, called them to him and saith unto them, you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, servant. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Wow. Now you see why God mentioned these guys in Ezekiel. Because those who are faithful, those who serve, those who have an excellent spirit and character and are obedient and build a boat against all odds or do whatever God calls them to do against all opposition, God sees them very highly in his eyes. Isn't that great for you introverts? Isn't that great? You don't have to shout from a mountaintop to please God. You don't have to. I mean, I'm not going to give you a, a free pass and say, you don't have to talk to anybody about Jesus for the rest of your life. I'm not going to say that. But I am going to say you don't have to have charisma. You don't have to have talent. You don't have to have all these abilities. You don't have to be able to be famous or Respected among, you think Noah had a lot of respect? What are you doing? I think at that point in history, rain was not even in the, in the, in the cards yet. All the moisture came up from the earth, if I understood it right. So you're building a boat for what? The well going to go crazy or what? So these guys had zero what do I want to say? Fame. But God says, no, no. He that's greatest is guys like these. All right, let's look at greatness. Luke chapter 7, verse 28. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is none, there's not a, I'm sorry, my eyes are getting worse. Born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God 
is greater than he. There's none greater than John the Baptist. None greater prophet. Other verses say none greater as a person. So what made John so special? John's better than Elijah. John's better than Elisha. John's better than Daniel. John's got them all whipped, if I can say it that way, in the kingdom of God. What did John do? You ever ask those questions? What did John do? What makes John so special? In other words, he was a great man of character, or his sermon would never preach. They would laugh him. So he had great character. And he did what God called him to do, and he did it even unto death. What's well, a tough statement to make, isn't it? Would you lose your head for Jesus? That would clear out the churches, and the real saints would be sitting on the pews, wouldn't it? <laughs> I hope that never happens. But does history repeat itself? Mm -hmm. So John prepared the way, and Jesus said, none greater than that. Mark chapter 10, 42 through 44. But Jesus called them to him and said unto them, You know that the way which are counted to you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever shall be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever will be chief. Did we just read that, didn't we? Didn't we? Okay. My fault. Great leaders lead with the power of love. not the love of power. I think I'll say that again. I'm not special. None of, our, none of these ministers up here are special. I think our pastor's special, but we're all servants. When God gives us stuff, can I say this very humbly? Don't let it go one out, one, in one year and out the other. Write it down. Put it on your phone. These are things that come out of prayer. They come out of God speaking to different men, get it in your heart, okay? Great leaders lead with the power of love, not the love of power. I'll give you a secular example. Bobby Knight was a coach for Indiana. Now we're in March Madness, right? Ladies, if, you, if this kind of goes past you, it's okay. Your husbands can fill you in or just nod your head like you know who they are. Okay. Bobby Knight was a coach for Indiana. He won three national NCAA championships in his 29 years. He was known, there's a lot of coaches that have won three before, but Bobby Knight stands out because he's a very extrovert person. His behavior is very fiery. He was thrown out of a game for throwing a chair on the court. He was allegedly reprimanded for grabbing one of his uh, students and grabbing him by the neck. And I'm, oh, I say student, one of his players, which is a student. And so he was no, I mean, with the press, he was just in their face. He would say things. He would do things. But he had success. He won three NCAA championships. And if you look at just that, you would say, well, I guess that's what it takes, right? Got to get in their face. Got to. Well, not unless you're John Wooden. John Wooden was a quiet guy who got to know his players on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And he, would, he had so many things fine-tuned. He would ask them about their shoes, 
if they're using the right shoelaces, that their feet are comfortable, uh, just all kinds of, he, he was meticulous in his assessment of his plays and his players. He had everything. He was one-on-one -on -one with them. Just, just a great guy. He won 10 NCAA championships in 12 years. Never been done. So, can you get championships being boisterous? Sure. Can you be successful not being boisterous? Most definitely. Proven by what we're seeing in today's month, March Madness, college basketball. So the next time you think you got to be mean and tough and rough and treat people with, with uh, disdain and, and just, you know, get your stuff done, think about these two guys. Yeah, you'll win once in a while, but you won't win 10. Because those who lead with the power of love are more successful. We got to go. John 13 and 5 says this, and this is something I have, whew, man, this is something. After he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded, then he cometh to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus said, answered and said to him, what I, do, what I do thou knowest not now. Man, that King James is getting rough on me. But thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Can somebody get me some water? If you don't mind, somebody. <coughs> Appreciate it. <coughs> Check this out. Yeah, preferably not out of baptistry. <laughs> I was going to see if you all was awake. <laughs> all right. Jesus said, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. I don't think we grasp that statement. I really don't. Thank you, Brother Brawl. I try not to get the mic and the water bottle mixed up. Never forget that. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I have to be honest, just a short commercial here. I had at home a microphone. I had a water bottle cut off the top. I, had to I was going to give that to Brother Brian. I said, I can't do it. He's my buddy. I can't do that. <laughs> now, Donald could. I know he could, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> All right. Jesus said, unless I wash your feet, listen to the New Living Trans uh, Translation version, you won't belong to me. Now I want you to listen to the Amplified version. We have nothing to do with each other. If you don't let me wash your feet, we have nothing to do with each other. You're out. How many's ever read that and just breezed by? I did. You're out. Man, that's rough. I got the Holy Ghost. Check this out. Acts 2.38. Now, you just buckle your seatbelt here. Acts 2.38 doesn't stand alone. Now, I'm not going rogue here. Just listen to me. Acts 2.38 doesn't stand alone. What do you mean by that, Brother Tim? Here's, almost, here's what is in my spirit. Acts 2.38 is a recipe. Ladies, you know that. We're on your side this time. Men, you don't have any. Some of you do. 
Acts 2.38 is a recipe. Repent, be baptized, in the name of Jesus Christ, remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's your recipe. But that doesn't stand alone. Because you could do all those things and go live like a dirty dog. And in Jesus' reference here, he said, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have nothing to do with me. What he's saying is, if you don't get this servant thing down, you're going nowhere. I don't care what. It doesn't matter. You don't belong to me. See, Acts 2.38 is the recipe. Christian servanthood is the oven that puts it all together. And when you bring it out, you're a perfect man or woman. That's why James 4 and 17 says this. Therefore to him that knoweth to do, God, do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Let me reword that, no, no offense to the scripture. Therefore to him that knoweth not to serve, to him, if he doesn't do it, it's sin. Now you understand why Jesus said, if you don't let me wash your feet, we're done. Because servanthood is the crowning completion of your salvation. Acts 2.38 important, you betcha. I've preached it over the years probably more than anybody or alongside everybody. But servanthood is what makes the case. Why has God given us all this? Luke's taught about it. Pastors talk about it. I've taught about it. We didn't get together and get our messages all together and said, you do this. Why is God bringing us all together? Because you, if you're going to get an influx of souls, guess what you got to have? you got to have servanthood in your spirit. you got to love people who smell. Servanthood. Jesus said, if you don't get it, we have nothing to do with each other. Check this out. This don't convince you I can't do it. God's nature is servanthood. And I'll borrow Joe Urshan's exhortation at the camp meeting. He said it and just jived right with what I had down. If you don't believe it, call on him. God, I need you in this situation. What is that? God is serving you. God, I've got a financial circumstance I need help with. I'm on my way. God, I've got family troubles. I need your help here. I'm glad you asked. I'm on my way. God, in his, while he was here on earth and today, is still a servant to the people of God. And if you don't believe it, call on him. See if he doesn't show up. Ask in what you shall receive. Guess who's bringing you the goods? God is. Well, I don't like serving people. Well, you've got, <laughs> we've got a lot of work to do. Because if we're going to be like Jesus, we're going to serve. Am I being too harsh this morning? You know I love you. I wouldn't tell you the truth. All right. I haven't seen anybody nod off. I guess I'm doing all right so far. Okay, we got to go fast. Servanthood. Job, his was an individual impact. He impacted his own life by his servanthood. When he ended at the end of the story, he had twice as much as what he had before, including his family. Daniel, nation impact. He served God faithfully and survived everything and changed the nation. And the king made decree that nobody could go against the God of Daniel. Noah. World impact. If Noah hadn't built a boat, you wouldn't be here. You ever think about that? I understand Adam and Eve were all from Adam. Okay? Adam and Eve were the first two. Well, that's true and not true. It's true in the initial sense. But if, Adam, uh, if Noah hadn't built a boat, the world would have been done. And guess what? You're a son of Noah. 
or a daughter of Noah because there was only eight in the boat. The world's survival, the world's survival relied entirely on Noah's servanthood to God in building the boat. And you don't think servanthood is important? The world's survival was based on his servanthood. Man. And here's the big kicker out of the whole thing. When no one else did serve God, as it was in the days of Noah, he was serving God amongst, amongst a bunch of heathens and still stood by himself and did it. So if you feel outnumbered, read about Noah. Okay, daily devotion. Here's what we say a lot of times. God changed my life. And here's what I feel like is God's reply to me. No, nope, I want to change your day. Because if I can change your day, I can change your life. We look at the big picture. God changed my life. I understand what you mean, what I mean when we say those things. But let me just tell you, unless God changes your day, you can't change your life. Tomorrow is determined today. And here's the important thing. God's future plans for you are predicated or determined by your present dedication to him. He's not going to graduate you to the, this next gifts of the spirit if you're a carnal knucklehead. So your walk with God today determines what you do for God tomorrow. Servanthood. 1 Corinthians 15, 31. A little verse we don't like. I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says this, I die daily. Now, Paul's a tent maker. He worked with his hands. If you ever try to put up a tent, it, it could make a video of it. Sometimes it's really humorous to watch people put up tents. They fall down. And put, get this side up, the other side falls down. Anyway, Paul had a secular job as a tent maker. Physical labor. He said, I die daily. This is for all you workers out there. He had three options. He either died before work. When I say die daily, I don't mean as a physical, you know, we all know that, but some people knew, no. Dying daily means I die out to myself, my will, my way, my plans, my, 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 my. Paul either did it before work. He did it during work or after work, but one of those three times he chose to take time to crucify his own will and flesh. So we got three choices. David talked about in Psalms early in the morning, Paul and Silas were at midnight, maybe somewhere in between. I don't know your schedule, but together we've got to take time to serve God and put our flesh on the, on the altar. Here's a statement that God shared with me, impacted my life. A spiritual undisciplined life, a spiritually undisciplined life will not get you out of the lion's den alive. And we're all going to be in the lion's den spiritually, financially, or however you want to categorize it. But a spiritually undisciplined life will not get you out of the lion's den, Daniel. But since you walked with God way before that, you're going to be just fine. Just fine. All right. 2 Timothy 1 and 6 says this. This is why I remind you, to fan into the flames the spiritual gift of God gave you when I laid my hands on you. Verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear but in timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. Fan the flames. I'm going to say this, and it's not even my notes, but just, okay? You just got to do it yourself. That's the bottom line. You got to do it yourself. If, if, 
if Chad's waiting on me, I may never come around. I may fall off and go my own way. He can't wait on me. He's got to do it himself. You can't wait on somebody else to get your car started. You got to get it going yourself. You got to have your personal walk, Noah, even if the rest of everybody, you know, everybody around you is just whatever they are. Have just Jesus set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. He said, I'm going to do what God has called me to do. And Peter said, oh, no, Lord. He said, Satan, get behind me. Was he calling Peter Satan? No, but he knew who was behind that statement. <clears throat> Mark Morgan one time said, told a story. He said this... Uh, this young man wanted him to get a word for the Lord for him. He's preaching three nights, and the first night, the young man said, the Lord told me he got a word for me. He said, you got it? I said, man, I ain't got it. Second night, the young man come up and said, you got my word? He said, man, I ain't got it. The last night of his preaching, the young man came up to him and said, man, you got that word for me? And he said, nope, sure don't. And the guy was frustrated. He's like, man, you're supposed to have a word for me. And Mark Morgan just basically said, you know what? You're supposed to get your word on your own sometimes and not depend on everybody else to have your word. Now, there's times you're going to be in the valley. You're going to be in a hospital bed. You're going to be somewhere where you need somebody's prayers and you need a word that has to come from somebody else. But if you got a walk with God in personal prayer and you're dedicated to God, you don't need a word every time a problem comes up and i got to call a pastor, give me a word. Call us up. Give me a word. Honey, God loves you, and if you're friends with him and you walk with him, you're going to get your word. You're going to get it. All right. I'm going to talk just my last little bit on prayer really fast. I really don't think we have a prayer problem. I really don't. I think what we have is a John, or I'm sorry, James 5.16 belief problem. James 5.16 says, confess your faults one to another. That's the first start of that. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces great results, wonderful results. And the apostolic church won't embrace that. Do we believe that? Thank you. If we believe that when we pray, it has great power and produces wonderful results, why in the world do we have trouble praying? Because we don't believe it. We believe that it's just the emptiness. It's just check the box. I prayed God today. If we believe this, we'll do it. I mean, and here's one thing you have to understand. Some of you elders do. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. You guys have more wisdom than I do. All right, you ready? Everything you pray is not in your lifetime. It's not. It's not in your lifetime. It's not all, can I say this and not hurt your feelings? It's not all about you. It's not all about me. It's not all about my prayers and what I need and what I want and what, 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 what. There's, there's elders who have passed on that prayed for me, and that's why I'm in doing and accomplishing things today because of their prayers. You're praying for things beyond you. I don't have time to go into it, but Jack Cunningham who are very respected. He's Billy Cole's nephew, and God uses him greatly. He said one of the things that the Lord told him was going to occur this year when he went and had his personal retreat with God every year he does, he said God said he's going to open. Look at Revelation 5 and 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts, and don't worry about all this, but four beasts and the four and twenty elves fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. 
And Brother Cunningham said, the Lord said, I'm going to start opening some vials this year that are the prayers of the saints that have been stored. So see, prayers don't always happen in your lifetime. And when you're praying, you may be doing it for the kingdom of God as a whole. You may be doing it for whoever, your grandchildren possibly, that you don't even know are going to be down the road. All right. I'm running out of time. I do want you to know this. I do want to do this one thing. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Now, the short story is God's a spirit. When you get the Holy Ghost, it's God living inside of you. Okay? The Bible says quench not the spirit. What that means is you stop. You don't stop the spirit from moving upon you and letting it use you, okay? You don't subdue it or anything like that. You don't stifle it, okay? Speaking in tongues is the Spirit speaking through you. It's as the Spirit gives the utterance. You never want to stop that. That is God speaking through you, okay? Or when you're praying and you start to pray in tongues, that is God praying through you, the Spirit praying. And here's why. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. We know not. We don't know sometimes how we should pray. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints. I, 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 mean, I got to go fast. There was a day that I just started speaking in tongues. I got off work, and I and and <laughs> I just got off work. And I'm just giving you this as an illustration. I was praying in tongues on the way home. I'm like, what? You know, I didn't do anything special. I wasn't, you know, I I worked. And you have this happen too. You just start flowing in tongues, and you have no clue because you may even had a bad day, and you didn't know, and just woo, there it goes, and you're like, what's going on? Well, an hour or two later, I was pummeled by the enemy. You know what pummeled is? That's like being beat. I was pummeled by the enemy. If I hadn't had prayed, let the Spirit work through me, that hour or two before, if I would have shut that down, I probably would have been in trouble. The Spirit makes intercession for you. Let it flow through your life. Let it flow. I'm out of time. Whew. Sorry. It's a lot in a little bit of time. But... Uh